I'm Rick Wagner. I work for Globus, which means I work for a lot of different places, and I've met many of you uh, in different roles at various times. Uh, at the moment, what I'm talking about is uh, some work we're doing for the ALCF to enable data services for the various projects, user communities, um, at, that are not just ALCF, but also with a little bit of an argon focus because we do have the advanced photon source and they're a large data generator. There's other groups that leverage the system. So um, it, it's quite a diverse mix. And what I'm focusing on is something that came out of, I think the leadership team at the ALCF and some of the other parts of Argonne, um, maybe Rick Stevens, Ian Foster, Mike, uh, looking at what does the ALCF need to provide to accommodate a lot of these large data sets. And you have the concept of the large scale systems, the leadership class systems, maybe there's a new one coming to Argonne, maybe there's a new building uh, that's been extended onto uh, our building 240 that uh, will be dropped in place. And there's large scale simulations. I work for E3SM, the climate modeling uh, group that is a part of the DOE, and we're producing data um, at all of the major leadership centers, and it's massive. That's just one example out of many. And then the data gets uh, subsetted and sent to systems like Cooley and others for analysis. And now we've got new capabilities like machine learning coming out that we want to be able to look at that data in new ways. Um, and also then you've got you know, the photon sources and others that are providing data that might, maybe it's going in the other direction. The data lands and then it goes to Cooley and maybe elsewhere. And how do you incorporate this across it and then provide the scientists with um, something besides the CLI? Uh, you know, I, coming from an HPC and supercomputing background, I totally understand that when we talk about the new systems, you're going to have those cutting edge people that are on the command line and trying to deal with the systems. But for, you know, day-to-day -day science, even at the highest levels, you want to provide familiar tools, uh, easy to use tools across the systems. And that's becoming very, that's very challenging at those levels. So as we go sort of from right to left, maybe it is the web interfaces, it's Jupiter, um, it's Galaxy, it's the visualization, you can visit, uh, things like that. So anyways, we're going to talk about what we've done for, in this case, looking, building on one of the services that have been, has been at the ALCF for a while, which is Petrol. I'll talk about that in a second. So this data is um, all over the place, and the science is collaborative, right? And especially the leadership computing facilities, they don't host scientists per se. By default, the scientists live somewhere else. They might actually be Argonne staff in the case of the LCF occasionally, but usually they're at some other university. So how does a scientist come in, find this data from their collaborator, um, get it somewhere useful, do the operations on it, and then share it out as part of a publication, especially given the restrictions where it's got to stay usually um, currently locked up behind an SSH wall um, with two-factor and things like that. And we believe, and what we've been driving towards, is Jupiter living at the center of this as a engine and facilitation point. And so the way we see it also is it's fundamentally a lot to do with auth, um, identity and access management, and multi-services, all these APIs that we're calling, and things like that. This is my Globus hat. So I'm gonna run through, how many of you have not heard of Globus? All right, everyone else just wait a sec, I'll be as fast as I can. All right, so um, what is Globus? Uh, and for those of you who have heard of Globus, I wanna make sure you hear about it in this context, in particular, what Globus Auth provides in securing REST APIs and for identity and access management, not just the I go to my browser or I submit a transfer and stuff like that. Um, so fundamentally, Globus tries to provide access across tiers. You know, we provide endpoints uh, that you install on site, and then we move data around. We talk to a lot of different types of storage systems. Um, Box is no longer cloud but planned, by the way. It does, uh, it is working. So we try to talk to a variety of storage systems so that when it comes to the data movement, you're not dealing with the interface. Uh, we do, part of Globus does live in the cloud. It's the part that manages the transfer. It's not the part that sees the data. The servers get deployed on your laptop on a server. The data moves between that. That it provides for um, 
the knowledge that the data's, the transfers are faster, you can do a science DMZ model. When it comes to security, yes, we see some things like file names. No, we don't see the data. We also can leverage that to put access controls in the cloud. Users have, or uh, both sites and users have the ability to create what we call a shared endpoint. It's an abstraction, kind of like a CH root, and then you can set access controls on folders underneath. And that's very fundamental to this architecture because it allows programmatic control of data movement and access um, without somebody having to go in, CH uh, chone, CH modifile, stuff like that. And in particular, I used to run the supercomputing systems at SDSC. I worked um, on the OpenSFS board for Lustre. I know file systems and I know HPCs. And one of the things that makes my blood boil is adding a POSIX account for a user that just needs data. All right, that just drove me crazy. I understand that what works in the current systems, but that's only because of how file systems are built and what's expected. Um, you should not be uh, enabling additional accounts on the system unnecessarily, and I consider that fundamentally unnecessary. Might be also why I switch jobs. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, one of the things you can do with Globus, and this is really what this is about, is develop app services and workflows. Globus Auth, one of the things that we had to develop to support all of this in terms of identity and access management, you can write your own REST APIs and secure them with Globus Auth. You can then build things that are clients, whether they're on the command line, we have a nice toolkit for that now, um, whether it's a portal, we've had that for a very long time, get tokens, talk to those REST APIs, do stuff. A lot of the simple cases are just talking to the existing Globus REST APIs, but really you wanna be able to write APIs that um, you, you're writing yourself, or can do the things that you wanna do. So. The challenges of building a platform like this, even on your own, is how do you have unified logins? How do you protect all these REST API communications? Is it the classic go loud, go, I'm gonna generate a token for you, download the token, now I've got yet another thing that's generating and managing tokens. Um, that's what Galaxy does, that's what a lot of other services does. Um, it's simple to do, but it means you're managing yet another service that's issuing uh, credentials for authentication. Um, and so how do we instead maintain that where you have a single place managing identities, for example, the universities, um, and not having to have it be tied to just the framework you're using. It's like, oh great, now I get tokens from Galaxy, how do I get it from over here? What if I wanna write a tool that talks to both? Now I've gotta talk two different things. Um, so let's make it web friendly and easier for users and developers, which in my mind means Let's not make another idiosyncratic um, research IT only solution. We're really good at that. Fortunately, I think the tide has shifted and we are now moving more towards what is out there and available in the commercial space. Um, so Globus Auth, uh, not so much transfer, but Auth. Uh, it's an identity and access plat platform service that um, brokers authentication and authorization um, between the end users and identity providers. For example, NERSC, the ALCF, in common, um, which supports all of these universities. Uh, you know, so instead of using Shibboleth, you'll see that um, you can easily enable an OAuth OIDC plugin um, to uh, the Globus, or to Jupyter Hub and talk to Globus Auth, which means immediately you can enable logins with um, your institutional provider more than likely. So once you start using Globus Auth, now you can start calling out to these different things. And part of the story is about how do we do that with Jupyter Hub. All right, so here's our starting point and building block, um, which is Petrol. So Petrol is a programmatically accessed storage system. It's maintained by the ALCF when within the uh, evaluation section, JLSE. And it's intended to enable collaborator projects to work with their collaborators around data to solve this problem of how do we not keep adding POSIX accounts? So it's a large scale, now 3.2 petabyte system. It was built on GPFS, it's now on Ceph. It's very fast, it has multiple 40 gig connections to several nodes. Um, and what we do is we take one of these shared endpoints, one of these abstractions, and we put management of it under the control of a PI. And we say, all right, this is your storage. You are responsible for who has access to it. You are responsible for who you can delegate granting access to. You manage this data. Um, you, are, you are in control of it. And from there, the PIs decide, who can I allow to manage this subfolder, that subfolder who can read and write the data? 
and but they can open it up to their collaborators because of where the data is hosted and the policies around it. Um, it allow, it means that we can have a area that is open and fast and accessible. Uh, there was a paper, early, paper recently put out um, by Katrin Hellman uh, about a cosmology data set uh, that leverages petrol and a portal that was built um, by some of the uh, advanced services team. Uh, and it really takes advantage of the performance that's there. So starting with this, now we can do more things. So we've got a bunch of these projects and we've built data portals for them and we're trying to see how far we can get in providing kind of a semi uh, homogenous interface to it. Uh, and by the way, one of the nice things about Petrol is it leverages the fact that we can do HTTPS access to data. You don't just have to go through the Globus endpoint. Um, the GCS, the Globus Connect server endpoints on there also will stream data over HTTPS. So that means that if you don't have an endpoint on a system, you can at least do puts, gets, um, back and forth to get data. Simplifies a lot of these smaller use cases or the case that somebody's on a random system on a login node, they don't know the endpoint, all they need to do is pull down a small file over HTTPS and authenticate. We can now do that. It also is really useful with the fact that we have an evaluation Kubernetes cluster and the fastest way to start getting nodes or data into a container or a pod was to just you know, use our tokens with our refresh tokens, flow them into the workflow, um, and then pull the data into the container, especially for small scale machine learning jobs. We grew Petrol um, recently over the last year, and we started extending what we've got available for JupyterHub. ALCF operates a production uh, JupyterHub instance, which is served on Cooley on a single virtual machine, and it suffers from a lot of the typical cases of the kind of the simple way to provide uh, JupyterHub to a group of users. You spin up a big VM, you spin up a large node, whatever, and if anyone remembers from Finding Nemo, the seagulls, you give any set of users a shared resource, and it is mine. Doesn't matter how many there are, it is all How long will my jobs take to spin up? Must be instantaneous, because that cluster is mine. Um, I, this has been going on for decades. It will continue to go on. And so once you know that happens, they oversubscribe it. Um, so over on the other side, we're trying something different. On Petrol Cube, we're trying to spin up a scalable version of Zero to Jupyter Hub. And we've got it running now, and it includes Clovisoft. The other one, this nice single shared instance um, running on Node, does have the ability to submit batch jobs, so you can do things like use Parcel or Dask or other things to spin up um, more resources, but primarily the notebook kernel itself is running on a shared resource. We're trying something different over on Petrol Cube. We've been able to use this to um, evaluate stopping power in machine learning. Um, we've been flowing data from the APS, like the neurocartography from Bobby Kasturi, um, directly off of the beam line to Petrol uh, with, a st with some, and then a workflow along the way that sends it back to do machine learning on it uh, for I think segmentation and other uh, center finding and stuff like that. So Petrol itself has been, by giving us a point, a linchpin uh, or a cornerstone, it has been very useful to start building around. So taking, taking a data centric approach, I can say has been fundamentally valuable. All right, so Kubernetes. Um, this is still very new for us, but we're making, again, steady headway. Uh, it's new for a lot of places, and I think that you know, there's questions about how does Kubernetes fit into an environment where people are mostly used to HPC systems. They're used to, I log in under my POSIX account, I do an LS, stuff like that, and I do it you know, on this shared resource that's all mine. Um, so we have, we repurposed some nodes within the JLSE. We started running the DL Hub machine learning workloads on them so that we could start pumping uh, things through and evaluating it. Uh, we just recently, finally after the, the upgrade, were able to put on Zero to Jupyter Hub. For those of you who are not familiar with Zero to Jupyter team, it's awesome. Uh, and if you have a Kubernetes cluster, uh, you can pretty much take the Helm charts as is and get them running um, with very little adaptation. And as part of the Zero to Jupyter Hub work, we incorporated Globus Auth, which means that uh, we now have tokens in the environment. 
And now with this, we kind of have two nice paths. One, we're gonna set up a test, uh, test area where we're gonna clone a lot of the repositories that we have with uh, sample Jupyter notebooks from Parcel, DL Hub, uh, the Material Data Facility, Globus itself, others we can find. And we'll start getting tokens in there and letting people evaluate what does it mean when I have these tokens in the environment. The other thing we can do is we can take our work and spin up other versions. So for example, I know the ALCF does a lot of training and it'd be nice to do classes on there. So now that we've got one running, all right, let's open up another one. And it doesn't have to be the same instance. We just spin up another pod and things like that. Um, there are issues. Data access and management in the Kubernetes context where, you know, yes, we are working towards being able to mount some of petrol on it, but then we have this concept of, all right, we've got this POSIX mount from a service account. How do we mount it into the pods? Who's actually executing that? Do we open it up to the same groups that have access to petrol in the project areas? Um, do we mount it read only for them so that they can say, all right, if you have access to petrol cube to run a pod, you should be able to read that data rather than move it. You know, kind of an open question. Um, yes, Globus is good for doing stuff like that, but it does mean that step of moving the data back and forth and sometimes making the data more accessible via amount is more appropriate. Um, identity management. Uh, in the case of Jupyter Hub, we've restricted the IDP down to the ALCF and we're mapping and logging users but they're pretty much tied to a service account. At some point, you know, we have to say, is this appropriate for all use cases or is it only appropriate for training and other science project cases? Um, but it, so this is the nice thing about having a test bed to evaluate that where we can put real science projects on there with some bumpers in place in terms of the type of projects they are. All right, so let's talk uh, about JupyterHub itself in the context of tokens and what we'd like to see more of. So as I said, we've got the production one and it's tied to the ALCF IDP, just a straight login most of you are familiar with. And now we've got this Globus auth, Globus auth version. What we want to do is, since you're logging in with Globus, we want to allow you, so we, we inject tokens into the notebook kernel and have some small boilerplate that can get them into the notebook itself. Um, it's a way to give you credentials to call REST APIs. And with that, now you sort of got this ecosystem of the rest of the world and services that you can call out to, um, at least services that are secure with Globus Auth. This model could easily be replicated if you're logging in with some other OAuth OIDC system, you can do these different scopes. But what we use them for, of course, is the ability to grab data from petrol, watch something like Parcel, which is a um, auto-parallelization, um, you know, creates a graph of your code and quickly runs it. And by the way, in some cases, it's a fair bit faster than Dask, so I'll throw that out there. It's also developed by Kyle Chard from Globus, and uh, I think they do good work. Dask? Oh. Awesome, okay, all right. Okay, um, so I said, as I said, we, could, we, we um, uh, contributed the Globus Auth plugin for OAuth OIDC it allows you to specify scopes. Like you can say, you know, you know, you can't talk to transfer and get data. Yes, you can talk to transfer and get data. Yes, you can talk to Globus Search. No, you can't. Um, and the tokens go into it. One of the things we contributed as part of the ALCF work was the ability to restrict the IDP. Not just that the user has to have an identity with that IDP, but that the user has to log in with that identity. Using Globus's new, uh, Globus, Globus Auth's new session, um, this was critical for like the leadership computing cases, is um, you know, Globus tries to be like, log in with any of your identities and we'll have mapped them so that you, people don't know who, have to know who you are everywhere. In this case, it's like, no, you really have to be an ALCF user and you've got to prove it to us to log in here because you're gonna execute code on our systems. So we've added that. Yeah. You do not need a subscription for that. Globus Auth is one of our free services. Most of Globus is free. Most of Globus use is free. Um, that's why we're appreciative of people like Mike for paying us to do work because we don't make so much money that we can just give away time to the ALCF. Um, and, but no, uh, Globus Auth and the Sessions API is totally open and you can just use it. So that plugin, and I don't know if that code has landed back upstream, but we'd be glad to contribute it. Um, so what happens, you log in, 
tokens flow into the database. Uh, Nick, I think, helped actually work on the secure attributes in the user database for that. They weren't totally there. And then from the spawner, they get put into the notebook server, and then you can call out to stuff. For those of you not familiar with OAuth and OADC, talk to me over coffee. You can do whatever you want. So the idea is you get your data, you pull your data set in, you analyze, you spit out a plot, um, and then you put it back somewhere and you share it out to your collaborators. This is my joke is um, it's 2 p.m. You've got your uh, advisor wants a plot by 4 p.m. for group meeting. Um, how do you get it somewhere they can see it quickly? Um, so if you want to try it, if you go to jupiter.demo.globus.org, that's the one that Globus uses for its training. And then there's uh, a Jupyter Hub example that does exactly that. It downloads a data set, plots a plot, puts it up on a public shared endpoint that we have that you can access it. Um, and then it'll give you the URL. So, all right, good. Got four minutes to tell you what we've learned. Number one. Since we're sitting at NERS, since we all have a badge, we had to get through the gate. Um, when you are doing something like this, this is new, this is novel. Yeah, it's cool, we can do it on our laptops, but at the DOE facilities especially, um, cybersecurity is something where uh, you can't just beg forgiveness. You know, this is, you can't just tell them, I have to do this. Um, you, you really need to make them your partner. Right. Um, you, you know, they have legitimate concerns and a job to do, and they are not your enemy. You know, I think most of us here in the room are mature enough to appreciate that. So make them your partner, tell them what your goals are, find out what their concerns are for their facility, your facility and policies, and work with them. Um, and, and then you can find solutions. In our case, you know, it was, all right, if we do the IDP restriction, we know who's logging in. Yes, they're going to a shared account, but we're isolating them in the container, et cetera. And that was adequate for the JLSC environment. We'll evaluate that, we'll look at the code some more, and we'll decide, you know, can we start to scale this up to other data? Um, also, um, I am a big fan of open source and I really enjoyed working with OpenSFS, um, but I will say that GPFS and Lustre make our life hard. Um, it is, a lot of it does come down to the data and it does come down to the fact that, you know, you want to hit that with POSIX access to go fast. And that's still why we provision POSIX accounts on the systems. Um, it's hard to manage access control without that to data. Um, and I would, but I do think that we can look more at what the NSF space has done, uh, at least here within the, the leadership computing facilities at the science gateways model. The service accounts, the communities accounts, um, one of the things about Globus and why we have the sharing model is if you just grant them access to a separate system and pull it in, kind of the old put get model, um, you can provide some of the access controls around that and it does mean some extra steps, but it works. Uh, and for the longer tail of science, for the stuff that isn't the absolute peak of the system, the other things, the things that were on the right side of the original plot, I think those are very important. Uh, we've recently also, so Globus Auth enabled SSH. This is SSH where you are on the command line and when you issue your login request to a remote system, you are sending a token, a NoAuth OIDC token to a PAM module that's with part of the same SSHD. This is no custom SSHD thing. Um, it's a PAM module that talks to a new, uh, talks to the SSH client then talks to Globus Auth and says, all right, this is RP Wagner at uchicago.edu. Are they allowed on to Midway at the UChicago RCC? It validates me and it lets me in. Um, and now, the nice thing about that is you can build a portal that allows you to log into multiple systems. You get the right scopes for UChicago, for Comet at SDSC, for Bridges at PSC, potentially other systems. Um, and from Jupyter Hub's case, that means that, well, if we're already getting tokens through Globus Auth, can we start to spawn on a variety of resources that have Globus Auth enabled? Um, that's pretty awesome. And we've been working on a Jupyter Lab extension for a while. It was developed by a student um, about a year ago, and I've got an intern who's revisiting it and updating it because we love 
as TypeScript and NPM uh, evolve and stuff like that. So she's gotten it working, um, and now we're trying to make it more user-friendly. So it is out there. And my last thought is, yes, I know Binder Hub does a lot of this, but within this space of security concerns, I do think containers play a stronger role because the container itself, especially a singularity container, which is a single file, um, can be signed, it can be checksummed, and it can be trusted. And so if you are in a system where they're saying, I only want to allow certain applications to run on it, um, do we trust the entire build process, et cetera, et cetera, or do we build it once and store it and then we pull it in? And then on systems now that the, and whether it's Singularity or Docker, we do have means to run them on both a Kubernetes cluster um, or an HPC system. So now you deal with the environment encapsulation and the I like this version, I like that version, I don't like your widget, I like my widget, um, and things like that. And so we give the ability to pull users into different tools. And one of the things we did develop uh, early on for the ALCF that's kind of lingering to come back is the Singularity Spawner. We worked on that a little bit more, and I think there's a lot more potential to enhance it uh, in the HPC space. So we'll get back to that one in a while. And it's 10.01. All right. So thank you, everyone. Any questions? So let, let, less of a question than a thank you. I just wanted to mention that the agroinformatics platform that I mentioned in my talk uh, it is, in fact, using Globus Auth and Globus Data for the data transfer. Awesome. Thank you. That's, that's like, we, we wrote this a while ago, and thank you. Uh, so the, the statement was, for the purposes of the, those announcements, the Agra... Agroinformatics. Agroinformatics platform, um, which got presented at Globus World a while ago. Uh, at that point, they weren't using Globus Auth in it. So thank you for deploying it. Um, and the fact that they're using Globus in their environment uh, is one of the first cases I've heard in the wild of Globus Auth being deployed in a Jupyter Hub and leveraging other Jup Globus services within that. Yeah. Right. Mostly a comment. I think it might be worth picking this topic up right here. Okay, that'll be great. So, a containers breakout, any suggestions? That's what sure. you said. I think, I think there's going to be two things that containers break out and maybe a how do you find We can figure out what we can Question. I'm curious about what differentiates a POSIX account per se from surely any user is going to have an identity and a list of groups to which they are attached. Like, at what level does making that a POSIX login differ from just attaching a 32-bit value to each of those? Um, well, let's take, I'll, I'll give you the case of the Kubernetes cluster. Um, in that case, when I log in as R. Wagner at and RP Wagner at ALCF.anl.gov, um, and I launch it, the underlying processes that it's running on, on are not associated with me. It is an untrusted account, but my login and the execution of the notebook server uh, on that environment in that little container um, is logged in the same way as if I were logging on through SSH to another system. So this is, and so fundamentally, so that's the impersonation. It's the impersonation problem, it's things like that. And then in this case, so in that case, all of the users and groups and stuff like that live within Globus, um, and all the trust and stuff have to happen within Globus groups and other things. And so that's also the, do you trust external web services? And which is 